I often think the saying, not everyone should have a podcast, is sometimes quite harsh. If people have got something to say and they've got an audience, then why not? However, when someone says that every detail about the moon is scientifically impossible, then I do often think that not everyone should have a podcast. <laughs> Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Tin Fall Tuesday with me, Simon Dan. Thanks very much for joining me. Okay then, on with today's video, which comes from a clip from the Danny Jones podcast. He's got a guest who claims the moon is scientifically impossible. Well, it's there, so I'd be interested to hear as to why. Here we go. And I'm not someone who's going to jump on really talking a lot about necessarily like that, the extraterrestrial influence type of concept. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, if there's anything that suggest outside intervention, it's the moon. It's the weirdest thing in the world. Like we have, we have, we know of no other satellite to a planet ratio like the moon. Our survey said. That's not true. Pluto and Charon have an even more extreme ratio. So the earth moon isn't a one off oddity. It's just the most significant ratio amongst the classical planets. The dwarf planet system shows that large lunar ratios can happen naturally and don't imply external intervention. Mm -hmm. the, the what its composition is, the way it the way that it, it balances life here and the size ratio for the earth and the sun, it's an impossibility. Yeah, it's one four hundredth the size it's and it's one four hundredth the distance, perfect and to create an eclipse. The moon is slowly moving away from earth at around 3.8 centimeters per year. In the past, it looked larger than the sun. In the future, it won't fully cover the sun at all. Total eclipses are a temporary phase in a long timeline, not something that's perfectly tuned. And we're told that the moon is just a uh, an accreted object that randomly formed that perfect shape that happens to be one four hundredth, right? To mm -hmm. be that perfect representation of the size to give create eclipse. Mm -hmm. It's Im it's impossible that that could be random. It's mm -hmm. impossible. You keep saying that word, but I don't think you understand what it means. The moon didn't randomly accrete. The evidence points to a giant impact origin, a collision between the early Earth and a Mars-sized body. Now that process naturally produces a large amount of debris in orbit, and that gathered into a single dominant moon. Its size and composition follow directly from the physics of that impact. Mm -hmm. There's no way that that the, all the those impossibilities could come together in one thing unless something wanted to create a perfect system here. Right. That's what it seems like our solar system is some kind of a, an experiment in creating a perfect system with ratios and to foster something here. And I think right. the more that I've studied, especially looking at tablets, is that that may have been all done for a lot of it, at least may have been done for us because of how important our story is. My word, we're a flipping self-obsessed species at times, aren't we? The problem with what he is saying here is that none of those things are perfect. The moon is drifting away from Earth, as I said. The sun is slowly brightening over time. And the conditions that allow life here won't last forever. If this was a finely tuned, deliberate setup, it would be a setup that only works for a brief window in a four and a half billion year timeline. There's nothing in the solar system that suggests design. Planet sizes, moon ratios, orbital distances, they're all explainable by standard formation processes. Gravity, collisions, and long-term orbital evolution. There's no pattern that points to intent, and certainly nothing that points to humans being the purpose. And how we actually have a far more profound connection to higher higher things than we know. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a guy in who, I think his name was, uh, fact check me here steve the guy named carl wolf who um found images uh he was working he was working in the space program and uh he was developing photographs and he went into this um secure location where they were actually like developing photographs of the dark side of the moon or whatever and this guy saw it and he described vividly that there was megalithic structures that were on the dark side of the moon. I'll take things that never happened for $500, please. The story he's referring to does come from Carl Wolf, a man who made this claim decades after he left the Air Force. There's no documentation, no photos, no colleague confirming this story, and no official record placing him in any role where he would have handled classified lunar imagery. 
NASA's lunar images, including the ones of the far side of the moon, are publicly available in extremely high definition. If there were megalithic structures, we'd be able to see them. The far side has been mapped on multiple missions from multiple countries, and nothing like that has ever appeared. This is a single unverified anecdote with no evidence. It's just repeated because it sounds dramatic. Yeah, I've definitely heard that. Oh, what a surprise. The guy who thinks the moon was built for us had heard that. And like, I think, I think he was killed. He he died mysteriously. Uh, he claimed he saw okay NASA photos of alien structures, quote unquote alien structures. Um, he died in a bike accident. So go go down to the top uh, paragraph, see exactly what it says. Yeah, yeah. F okay, F uh, former U.S. Air Force photo. He was a photo technician who claimed he saw the secret NASA photos of the structures on the on the, on the surface of the moon. So um, I don't think he actually said whether he believed they were alien or not. What he said was they were megalithic looking structures yeah. on the dark side of the moon. Yeah. Let's have a quick look at what Carl Wolf actually said, shall we? So he was showing me how all this worked and we walked over to one side of the lab and he said, by the way, we've discovered a base on the back side of the moon. And I said, I said, whose? <laughs> what do you mean, whose? He said, yes, there's, we've discovered a base on the back side of the moon. And at that point, I became frightened and I was a little terrified thinking to myself that if anybody walks in the room now I know we're we're in jeopardy we're in trouble because he shouldn't be giving me this information I was fascinated by it but I also knew that he was overstepping a boundary that he shouldn't be stepping over and then he pulled out one of these mosaics and showed showed this base which had geometric shapes there were towers there were uh, spherical uh, buildings. Uh, there were very tall uh, towers and things that looked somewhat like radar dishes, but they were large structures. So he says a technician casually told him that we've discovered a base on the back of the moon and then showed him a photo mosaic full of towers, spheres and radar like dishes. That is it. No photos were kept, there's no documentation, just a single conversation that he said happened in the 1960s, but didn't mention it publicly until the 1990s. All sounds a bit fishy, right? And so there's a couple really weird things, and I guess Randall's really good in the moon stuff, but yeah. I mentioned a couple things. Um, one, when they did studies of, the, there was a whole Russian team, and I don't remember if it was the 70s, or, or 80s, but a Russian team did a study on craters in the moon. Have you heard this? Uh, what, how they're the de all the same depth? Yeah, mm -hmm. and then none of them, no matter how large the radius of the crater is, none yeah. of them exceed a certain depth. Right. Which is so weird because Very weird. the depth should be di directly determined based on the size of the impact, mm -hmm. right? So something's larger mm -hmm. that creates a larger impact crater should go deeper into it. Right. And yet none of them do. They never, they never go past a certain depth anywhere on the planet. They never do. This is a classic example of why you shouldn't talk about things that you have no knowledge in. This claim comes from a misunderstanding of earlier Soviet papers on crater morphology. They never said that all craters are the same depth. What they found is that large lunar craters stop getting proportionally deeper once they reach a certain size. Once a crater gets above a certain diameter, around 20 kilometers, the impact excavation becomes so dramatic and so energetic that the wall slump inward and the floor rebounds upwards. Small, simple craters can be five times deeper proportionally than giant complex craters. For example, Tycho crater is around four and a half kilometers deep, Clavius is around three and a half kilometers deep, and smaller craters can be a kilometer deep despite being very tiny. The depths vary hugely. And the weirdest thing is when after the Apollo missions, when they sent a, a probe to crash into the moon, I'm sure you know about this, it rang like a bell for, for like, over an hour. For like, yeah, for hours. Mm -hmm. It just rang, which show, which tells us that it's well, here's an interesting composed take. of metallics and is hollow. Like, is that? This one comes from Apollo 12, where NASA deliberately crashed the spent lunar lander onto the moon. Now, seismometers recorded vibrations that lasted a long time. And one of the scientists described it as if the moon was ringing like a bell. Now that was a metaphor, not a literal acoustic ringing. The moon's crust is extremely dry and rigid with no water in it to dampen vibrations. So seismic waves can travel much further and last much longer. So a long vibration doesn't mean hollow. A bell rings because it's solid and elastic, not because it's empty inside. The moon's behavior is exactly what a solid, dry, brittle body would do. Steve, ask ChatGPT, <laughs> what is the size of the moon compared to the Earth? 
and then Google, and then ask ChatGPT what is the mass of the moon compared to the Earth, and the variation is crazy. Oh, it's like it's like light. It's a it's really really light. Oh, it, it, it but it's also the strongest thing ever at the same time. Right. What are these two blithering on about? If the moon were made of the same stuff as Earth, so the exact same density, then being 27% the diameter of Earth, the moon would be 2% the volume because volume scales with the cube of the radius. But the moon actually only has around 1.2% of the uh, Earth's mass. Now that difference is explained entirely by density not weird physics or hollow structures. This is basic mathematics and one of the simplest calculations in planetary science. Yeah, it's likely hollow and the, the theories, and I mean, again, if you're gonna try to figure something out, you gotta go back to the old Sherlock Holmes thing, right? And it's important, it still rings true to this day. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to figure something out, you use that old method, right? Whatever, when you're trying to explore something, you explore all possibilities and whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. That holds true for anything. Mm -hmm. So we eliminate everything, right? Let's eliminate all the things that aren't there. It has a certain depth. The craters can't go past a certain depth. It rings. It's lighter. So what does that mean? What's all that's left? Well, it's not natural. It has some kind of a, a, a shield, like some kind of a metallic or something underneath the, 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 the ground. Yeah. Something to prevent anything from going deeper. And if it's a metallic-like object, it somehow is hollow too. Right, let's wrap this up then with doing the Sherlock Holmes thing. What Holmes meant was, only if you fully understood every possibility should you consider the unlikely one. Here, every eliminated possibility is actually correct physics that's been thrown out by them. Let's go through the points. He said craters can't go past certain depths. Well, we've already seen that they can and do. Large craters collapse inwards and cause flat floors. That's standard impact mechanics across the solar system. Nothing to eliminate there. He then says the moon rings, so it's hollow. It rang because the moon is dry and rigid and lacks the water to dampen the seismic waves. Solid rock structures can ring, nothing to eliminate there. He then said it's lighter, so it must be hollow. It's lighter because it has less iron and a smaller core. Exactly what the giant impact model predicts. So nothing to eliminate there. Every single piece of evidence that he says isn't natural is already explained naturally. He's not eliminating possibilities, he's just ignoring them. And that's gonna be that for another episode. People really should research things properly before going on a podcast and making themselves look a bit silly. Please do let me know in the comments below what you thought of this episode. As I say, we're all done and dusted for another one. Thanks so much for watching today as ever. It's appreciated. If you enjoyed it, please do consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the thumbs up button too. I've been Simon Dan. Have yourselves a great day and I'll see you tomorrow for my favorite flurf, Anthony Bear. He's back. See you then.